Hi, I'm Greg Norman. If there's one thing I've always admired, it's the ability to be the best, no matter what the obstacles, over a long period of time. This year marks the 50th birthday of one such Australian legend, the Holden Motor Car. In 1948, Prime Minister Ben Shipley officially launched this car, the Holden 48215, with the happy words, she's a beauty, she still is. During this program, we're going to take a look at those 50 fabulous years and see why Holden has been such an icon in this country. It's an Australian success story that we can all be proud of. began in 1856 when James Alexander Holden set up a business in Adelaide making harnesses and saddles. By 1879 the business of J.A. Holden and son Henry was well established. Then family friend Henry Frost joined and Holden and Frost began repairing and building horse-drawn carriages and coaches. By 1905 when Henry Holden's son Edward joined, the motor car was making its presence felt on Adelaide roads. So Holden and Frost moved into car repairs, mainly in upholstery, and was soon manufacturing hoods and side curtains. The first General Motors cars were exported to Australia from America in 1914. And when the events of World War I caused an embargo on the importation of car bodies, Holden and Frost began large-scale local production. By war's end, a new company had been set up. It became one of Australia's biggest industrial enterprises. Six years later, Holden's opened Australia's most modern production line at Woodville in South Australia. It was so impressive that General Motors struck an exclusive deal with Holden's. And it was in 1928 that Holden's famous lion and stone symbol, representing the legend of man's invention of the wheel, was first used. When the worldwide depression hit in the 30s, the number of car bodies holders built per year tumbled dramatically, from 36,000 to 1,600. As a result, GM bought it out and formed General Motors Holdings. Englishman Lawrence Hartnett was given the challenge to turn GMH into a profitable and expanding company. New body types and production techniques were introduced with great success. General Motors Holdings set up an impressive new headquarters and assembly plant on 20 hectares of land at Fisherman's Bend in Melbourne. It was then that Hartnett and other GMH executives began pursuing an ideal, the manufacture of a complete car in Australia. There was no doubt in their minds the company had the talented managerial and production people to achieve this goal. But the dream was put on hold when a far greater challenge arose winning the Second World War as part of the Allied forces. General Motors Holden's factories around Australia were soon all working for the war effort. They built airplane frames. Bomb cases. Guns. Trucks boats, and other military hardware. It was an immense effort by Holden's people. Everybody had to learn and produce quickly, so skills and techniques advanced just as rapidly. In 1940, Prime Minister Bob Menzies opened GMH's new paper plant in Sydney. 
It's the name they speak to the appreciation of those who, so far as possible, and in spite of the state of war, are developing the economic and industrial bases of the country. Not so long ago, factories were gloomy buildings in gloomy streets. Thank God those times have gone. And a new standard of industrial life has arisen. Productive of plants good to look at, good to work in. Plants such as this. There might have been a war on, but Australians still needed cars. skills, from making tents, to torpedoes, to mass producing internal combustion engines. It was the age of multi-skilling, long before that became 90s jargon. The tide of the war began to turn, so Lawrence Hartnett and his fellow executives revived their plans for the first full Aussie car. GMH engineers started designing the car they believed the company was best set up to build and the first prototype was completed in 1944. Soon, dozens of variations, alternative designs, and mock-ups followed. There was a sense of excitement and expectation building within Holden's. The war effort proved the potential of secondary industry in Australia, so the government threw out the challenge. GMH was ready and determined to manufacture a car without subsidy or tariff protection. Late in 44, Hartnett went to the U.S. and won over the General Motors hierarchy. C. Wilson, on the other hand, was a, a pro, and uh, he made a very pointed question to me. Uh, so, uh, well, Larry, uh, supposing we said go ahead, would it be the Chevrolet or the Vauxhall or the Opel? And I said none of them. It was designed for low volume from the peculiarities of Australia. And much to my surprise and relief, he said, God damn good horse sense. So uh, that was an approval. The war ended in triumph for the Allies and for General Motors Holdings. The company had a full-scale foundry and most importantly had advanced markedly in production techniques and skills. So GMH engineers traveled to Motor City, Detroit, Michigan in the USA with their styling models and ideas for the Aussie car. The company set up an office for us in the General Motors building and we had a complete uh, design office there, uh, drafting and, uh, and, and also facilities to get parts manufactured. And we designed the car and uh, uh, had the parts made from different suppliers and different, different branches of the General Motors organization. And we built three complete cars. After we built the cars, we, uh, we uh, tested them on the General Motors proving ground. The one in uh, uh, Milton was, was a very elaborate place with all sorts of pills, skid pans, and, and speed loops, and, and the, the car was uh, exercised there, largely to develop uh, the, the ride and handling and uh, all that sort of thing which could be done at uh, it's such a the Australian car passes over the same Belgian block pavement on its way to one of the many special hills of the proving ground. This is a 27% grade. The car climbs 27 feet for every 100 feet of forward travel. The Australian car takes to the high speed plane for an engine performance test. It is powered by a six cylinder valve and head engine with a displacement of 132 and one-half cubic inches. It has a bore of three inches, with a three and one-eighth inch stroke. The engine has an SAE rating of 21 and six-tenths horsepower, producing 54 brake horsepower at 4,000 revolutions per minute. Exacting tests made of proving grounds, General Motors Engineering, through commercial specifications. 
locations supplied by the staff of General Motors Holden have produced the new automobile for Australia. In late 1946, three handmade cars were shipped in secrecy to Sydney. They were accompanied by the Australian design team and 22 American technicians and their families. We were the Australians. Uh, we had gone over without our wives. So we, we'd been in America with, uh, without our wives for periods from six months up to 18 months, in, in, in the case of one, uh, Tabby. Uh, and, uh, uh, we assumed that somebody would take the cars and get them over to Fisherman's Bend and uh, we took the opportunity of uh, meeting up with our families again. Unbelievably, the three cars were driven under cover of darkness from Sydney to Melbourne and nobody from the press spotted them. The secrecy was holding, well, almost. We disguised the cars, of course, the front grills, of course, were disguised with, with a grill that wasn't even looking anything like what it was to be finally, and we had some panels on the fixtures on the on the uh, rear fenders and odd bits and pieces like that. But it wasn't very long before the locals up around Calista and these parts, seeing these cars pass every day, they they worked it all out. They knew what was happening long before the car was released. To survive the many and very road conditions of Australia. The cars would have to be tough, so nothing was left to chance. Our aim at those, in those days was to accumulate about 35,000 miles, uh, more or less trouble-free. This was our objective. And parts that gave us trouble in the meantime, of course, we would have to maybe do a bit of redesign or alteration work to make sure that they met our standards of test. <laughs> Cushion springs take the weight of above average adults in a bumping test. Under these continual stresses, any weaknesses would soon be revealed. In April 1948, a production run of 10 cars was done under even more secrecy. Everybody at GMH knew that the time to launch their new car was close, but what would it be called? The koala, the kangaroo, even the emu, and the melba. There were just some of the names suggested by executives, employees, and the public for Australia's own car. GMH executives wanted the name of our new car to be short and catchy, and definitely Australian. Finally, a name was chosen. Would you believe? The Canberra. But then, there was a change of mind. Why not salute the name that began it all? the first Australian car, with the official model designation 48215, would be called the Holden, after James Alexander and his family. What a fitting tribute to the adventurous, innovative trio of James, his son Henry, and grandson Edward, who had inspired achievements beyond even their wildest imaginings. The Holden, it was the perfect name. At Fisherman's Bend, the employees worked around the clock to have everything ready for the November 29th launch day. After years of planning, testing, sheer determination, and hard work by GMA throughout Australia, the Holden 48215, commonly known as the FX, was ready to roll. It's a great sense of satisfaction and relief when you see all of your work. See, we worked on it uh, well, two years in Australia and then almost two years in America. That's four years, four years of uh, constant work. And, uh, you know, you become a, a little bit edgy at the end of it. You're wondering whether it's going to be a success and uh, how the public will receive it and uh, all of these doubts about it. But uh, it was very exciting, actually. There was really never any chance that, that it would be a script in any, in any way. It was a great day, that day 50 years ago. If the men and women of GMH were proud and excited, then so was Australia's Prime Minister Ben Shipley. He loved the car.
Krista Chipley had been one of GMH's strongest supporters in their efforts to build an Aussie car during his time in government. So to see his delight meant a great deal. It was now time to let the public have their say. Would they like this new holder? The reaction was immediate and overwhelming. Australians loved the holder. Everybody wanted to be the first in their street or town to own one. It wasn't a fussy car to drive. It was a car that the minute you got in it and drove it around the block seemed effortlessly easy. By comparison with the British cars at the time, which generally had smaller engines and needed a lot of revs to get them going, this was the exact opposite. You could just sort of stroke it along at first and second in no time. You were in top gear and very responsive top gear. And as I say, I think in the first few minutes of driving it around the block, the potential buyer probably thought, gee, this is really comfortable motoring and I like it. It was very exciting, actually, when it turned out to be uh, such a success. I mean, we started, we started building, I think, 10 a day, and then uh, the orders started to flow in, and we couldn't, we couldn't cope with them. We, we increased the production, and we finally got it after, after a few months to 100 a day, and from there on, it went on and on. And I remember seeing the very first Holden coming to our town, coming to this bridge. I stood on the footpath on the edge of town, watching it wind down this little narrow, dusty road into this bridge. And we stood there. I was about three or four year old time, just watching this car. And it was just magical. He was this mythical Holden. Drove it by, all waved, and it drove up the road to where this guy owned it. And it was just a uh, part of your life that you'll never forget. So began our enduring love affair with Holden. The bodies move steadily along conveyor lines while safety glass, upholstery, and the many fittings are placed in position. From the vision of the stylist, the skill of planning of the engineer, the detailed drawings of the draftsman, and the exhaustive road testing of prototypes, more than 100,000 Australian made urban cars and utilities have been produced. very good for each other. The Steel War years were long gone. It was the decade of families and fun and rock and roll. I suppose in a sense it gave motoring to Australia. There'd been other Australian cars before, but none of them ever commercially viable. Suddenly there was a car that almost from the moment it was released was commercially viable. The market wanted it and they were prepared to pay for it and it went in droves. Well, young fellow, now you're racking the road. You bet I'm ready and raring to go. Boy, oh boy, am I glad to get out of that showroom. The open road for me. Hills, I just love them. Watch me take this bend. Just fingertip control will slip those gears of mine wherever you want them. And now to the manly carnival. There'll be plenty to see here. For sheer beauty, this would be hard to meet. Well, here we are, arriving at National Park. We're certainly getting around. Well, you good people who have listened so patiently to my story, you too can enjoy all the pleasures of mercy. I have plenty of brothers and sisters. Just tell them that we are that you know me. Yes, that's right. The name is Holden. Another legendary part of Australian popular culture, the Ute, was introduced in 1951. And planning was already well underway for a new model, to be known as the FJ. The most noticeable visual change would be the grill. How would Australians respond to changes to their car? GMH waited nervously. If the public loved the 48215, 
then they absolutely adored the FJ and his exuberant new grill. There was no doubt that Holden was Australia's most popular car and drivers were already becoming fanatical in their response to driving Holden's. There was a close bond among all at GMH. They worked hard and made sure they enjoyed themselves, especially at their annual picnic. wanted to introduce a more modern Australian design body which was bigger and roomier. Considering how hugely successful the FJ had been, many thought they were taking a big risk. We were always a little apprehensive as whether we'd get the same reaction that we'd had at previous models, but uh, usually we were very, very happy as it, as it came about. The dealers were all very excited and people just flocked into showrooms. So uh, we were actually on a, on a real high at that time. The interest in that in the new hold in those days was just phenomenal. You used to get front pages of the newspapers and posters, actually newspaper posters, saying new Holden, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Well, the FE, for instance, which was the first move from the old round shape to what you call a three box shape today, uh, was a very dramatic move, but very few people knew about it. Although our magazine had scooped, uh, had some scooped photos from the Sydney Pagewood plant. The FE was launched in July, 1956, and once again, Holden could do no wrong. The FE and Australia seemed made for each other. Holden, you and my Holden. the FE was released, see the Australians, we were starting to gather quite a bit of experience by this time, and we uh, we had a bigger hand. This was, I think, the greatest thrill because we we were sort of starting to spread our wings at this stage. Our, our engineering organisation was becoming a little more sophisticated, and we could do these things, and I think this gave us a big thrill, or it did me anyway. He is known as the average man, and he was used by General Motors Holdens in designing the new Holden. In short, Mr. Average Man is just a transparent plastic cutout, but he conforms to the general physical appearance of the average Australian. He was used in checking the position of the seats, the brake and clutch pedals, and the steering wheel. Indeed, he was very important throughout the three years it took to develop the new Holden. Whether your family is small, 